But mostly what we did is we focused on, we'd get the, the hymn books and we'd call it booking. <laughs> Have I told this story before? No, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, 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 wait. Today's episode of the show is brought to you by Audible. More on them in just a bit. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze. As always, I'm your host, Simon Wimers here. Kevin, one of my writers, has written me a script. I'm going to read it. Sam afterwards is going to edit it. And uh, that's what we do here, here, isn't it? Uh, wait, what's the title of this? What am I reading? <laughs> So well prepared, Simon. You're so professional. You always come with your A game. I'm not feeling like my A game today. I'm just getting over a sickness, like a cold. Like I was fully, like, colded out last week. And I'm still not fully there. Probably sounding a little bit nasal. Let's just get on with it. This is uh, Crazy Stories of Ancient Gods Being D... Oh, I remember this one. Ancient Gods Being Douchebags, D-Bags for YouTube. Um, because I like to make money. Uh, we did this on side projects and it was so funny. I was just like, let's just do it again. But like new stories and stuff, but for Brain Blaze, because that's where it really belonged after that side project episode, isn't it? So let's just go. Before I began appearing on Brain Blaze, I had a bad habit of pitching ideas to Simon for side projects that absolutely belonged on this channel instead. There we go. One of those pitches actually got approved, and I highly recommend you go check out the video of the same name over on that channel after watching this one. <laughs> you could do that if you want to. That may be a more serious channel, but the stories are so absurd that Simon couldn't read them with a straight face or for or without inserting some commentary. Yeah, because they were insane. There was all sorts of stories about people catching sperm and sh**. You're like, <laughs> what's up? Oh! Ew! Dude! What the f I loved it. It was really good. I love that shit. Like, I like having a laugh at work. Because mostly it's so serious. Such a serious job and I'm such a serious person. Oh, yeah. If you want a taste of what's over there, some of the stories include Loki accidentally killing multiple people the one time he wasn't actually trying to be evil, a battle between Egyptian gods involving talking semen and some extra creamy lettuce, I think that's the one about the catching of the sperm, and the disgusting origin of the Minotaur, hint it's half human, half bull. Oh, I recorded this months ago, but I do remember that story, which I'm not going to retell now because you can go watch that side projects video, thank you so much. Luckily, mythology is absolutely insane so there are more than enough ridiculous stories of ancient gods for us to properly blaze so sit back relax and remember that these are all stories involving deities that various people actually believed in and worshipped <laughs> oh it's silly worshipping like made up things isn't it <laughs> what a ridiculous idea Get off my damn lawn. Every religion has a creation myth. In the book of Genesis, God creates Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and it's a pretty mundane and boring endeavor. In Egyptian mythology, the god Atom rubs one out, and that creates the universe. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> universe! Where did Atom come from? Who rubbed Atom out? If we want a truly insane creation myth, we're going to have to take a look at the ancient Mayans, since the Mayan names would almost certainly be butchered anyway. Hey, Kevin, give me some credit. I always get ancient Mayan names entirely correct. My second language is Mayan. <laughs> this is Mayan. Did, do we know how that works anymore? Did we translate? I guess we must have translated Mayan, right? I mean, obviously, I know this as it being my second language. Mayan. I'm gonna change the names to make them easier to read. Thank you. Please change the names to like Jeff. It's like, and then Jeff said that, and then Peter said this, and then Jane was like, "Hello." It was like, "That's what I want. That's what I want." Like, I want my my culture to be shoved onto other people's culture to make it easier for me. That's the kind of world that I want to live in. The ancient Mayans a joke, but it would make things easier pronunciation-wise. The Spanish have it fucking down, man. <laughs> Their empire. No. Although I was having dinner with a mate of mine the other day. Bing, 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 bong, 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 bong. Get those lights off. Bing, 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 bing. And, like, I don't know. Being British, it's like we don't. You know, I'm not like, oh, yeah, British Empire, pretty tight. 
the, but I think the Spanish people view it a little differently. Spanish people, let me know. Or is my friend just a little bit nationalisty? Because he was like, I don't know, man. Spanish Empire was pretty good. And I'm like, oh, it was, huh? <laughs> it was. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we, uh, we did some civilizing. It's like, whoa. I mean, he didn't say that. But he kind of like gently in his Spanish way sort of said that. And I'm like, hmm, interesting. What the fuck is this? I don't know. What are we talking about? Ah, yes. Empires. The ancient Mayans had a very popular ball game. The rules are only partially understood and seem to have changed several times over the millennia, but it's kind of like a cross between soccer, basketball, and possibly tennis, and it dates back at least 3,000 years. Is this the one where they murdered each other at the end or something? If they won, they got murdered, I think was like the, the crack with that sport, which is weird, to be honest. Anyway, two twins, one and seven, Oh, we're just calling them numbers, okay. <laughs> we're big fans of playing ball. They would play constantly, but they were loud and obnoxious, and the noise drove the gods of the underworld crazy. To put an end to all this tomfoolery, the parrot-shaped bird god Seven Macaw invited the brothers down to the underworld to play a game against the gods. The twins accepted, but it was unsurprisingly a trap. There were several nefarious tests for them in the underworld, including things like the Razor House, a building full of sentient knives that wanted to cut them to pieces. Fucking hell, man. That is some nightmare for you right there. What's that? That's the razor house. What's in there? Knives, which intelligent knives, and they all want to fucking stab you. Soinks, it's the gay blade. That is, that is, I mean, it kind of feels like it'd be one of those um, Blumhouse horror movies, right? That'd be, I, I, maybe this is a horror. It could even be called the razor house. That's brilliant. Genius. I'd watch that. I'd watch the sh out of that. After failing one of the tests, the gods killed them and tied their decapitated heads to a tree in the center of the underworld's ball game court. That's pretty rude, but one and seven are referred to as the first twins because this story is about to get a whole lot crazier. One of the denizens of the underworld was X Kick, also known as the Blood Maiden. I get the feeling is Kevin using these names from like anime that I haven't seen, cause. He's always like, he slips them in to uh, some other things he writes. And then people are like, Simon has no idea that he's reading about this anime stuff. And like, dude, someone's called X Kick and Blood Maiden. That feels like it's got anime written all over it, doesn't it? That feels like animated up. She was indeed a maiden made out of blood. And she visited the tree in court, where the disembodied heads rested. The spirit of one of the twins encouraged her to take a piece of the skull-shaped fruit that was growing on the tree, and when she did, it spat on her, impregnating her. Oh my. Hey yo, what the fuck? X-Kick gave birth to the second twins, and she and her bastard twins were exiled from the underworld. Dear, so did you swallow? <laughs> did you? Wait, wait, wait. Did one of the skulls, the, the like rotting twin skulls, that's fucked up. Man, these stories are fucked up. They are like someone wrote down their dreams, aren't they? It's crazy. All right, let me interrupt today's video to tell you about today's fantastic sponsor, which would be Audible. You don't ride an elevator for the music or pick an airline for the movies. <laughs> No, you don't. You don't do any of those things. Is elevator music actually a thing, or is that just something that only exists in the movies? Doesn't matter. It's not what we're here talking about today. Look, when it comes to audio entertainment, it makes sense to choose Audible. It's the home for stories told by the biggest stars like Ethan Hawke, Kerry Washington, and Kevin Hart. It's home to epic adventures, chilling mysteries, and calmest comedies. I have to say, the book that I chose to recommend today is like none of these things. <laughs> I was recently listening to uh, Principles by Ray Dalio. He's like a business guy, but he wrote this brilliant book. And it's just like all of his kind of his philosophies on doing things. And he's really smart and he has like a really good take on so much stuff. It's uh, Principles, Ray Dalio. That's what I'd recommend. But there are epic adventures and chilling mysteries as well. Sure, uh, if that's what you're into. I have to say... I don't know if I should say this in an ad for Audible, but I'm definitely vastly more consuming nonfiction audiobooks. I just find it's an amazing way to learn stuff. Like, I find it harder to read nonfiction than fiction, just because I don't know, sometimes my brain will switch off. But with Audible, I just find it easier to get that nonfiction into my brain, which is which is brilliant. Audible have an incredible selection of audiobooks across every genre from bestsellers and new releases to celebrity memoirs. Oh my god, Arnold Schwarzenegger's Total Recall is another amazing audiobook that you should listen to. Mysteries and thrillers, motivation, wellness, business, more. As an Audible member, you can choose one title a month to keep from their entire catalogue, including the latest bestsellers and new releases. Yeah, it's like, so if your Audible membership, if you end it, it's not like you can't listen anymore, it stays with you, which 
which is awesome. You you like own it. Members also get access to a fully to a growing selection of included audio audiobooks, Audible originals, and podcasts. You can download or stream our included titles all you want. New members can try Audible for 30 days. All you need to do to try Audible for 30 days is visit audible.com forward slash blaze or text blaze to 500 500. Thanks to Audible for sponsoring. And now back to today's video. The twins would grow up to have various supernatural powers, including turning their uncles into monkeys just for laughs. The twins, Hunax and X Balance, also found their father's old sporting equipment and took up playing ball on the same court that had pissed off the underworld gods in the past. They also used a blowgun to kill the stupid paragon because, oh well, f that guy. Eventually, the twins were invited to the underworld. Having known what happened to their father, they were wise to the gods' tricks and were able to outsmart them and survive the Razor House and other such challenges. As they completed the challenges, they got to play against the gods in multiple ball games. Each time they threw the match so as not to embarrass the gods. Yet, during one of the gods' challenges, Hunax was decapitated by a bat and his head was used as the ball for the next game. <laughs> The twins were able to swap out the head for a rubber ball during the match and reattached his head because why not? This is someone writing down their dreams. I'm so I'm like not even entirely following, but there's people getting their heads chopped off, blah blah blah. It's crazy. This time, they thoroughly trounced the gods with a humiliating defeat. As a prize for their victory, they were invited to sit inside a large oven, which they did. <laughs> Okay. It's like, hey, step into this oven. Congratulations if you're like, bro. I don't want to go in the oven. I don't like, like, ovens are not places that I intend, I usually want to go inside at all. This was part of the plan. The twins were burned to ash and tossed into the river, but their ashes retook the forms of first of catfish, then of human boys, who now had godlike powers. They demonstrated their abilities by just the, the, the catfish thing. It's like so someone writing down their dreams, like an eight year old writing down their dreams, because why? Because why? They demonstrated their abilities by killing denizens of the underworld and bringing them back to life. Impressed, the gods wanted to see this ability for themselves. They invited the twins, who they did not recognize as Hunax and X Balance in new bodies, to perform the trick for them in person. The twins came before the gods and killed one of them. They then refused to bring him back to life because, well, f that guy. How do you kill a god? He's a god. Shouldn't he be able to, like, and then rise back up? Like, isn't that like a god thing? Can you imagine being a god and they're like, nah, you're still mortal? Be like, out. What, what, what's the point of being a god if you're not immortal? Ridiculous. The gods can be killed! Oh, I'm a fucking idiot. I'm dead now. Oh, they then left the underworld and went to live with the sky gods who immediately promoted them to, pr promoted them to the soul roles of sun and moon. And that's where the story ends. It is someone's dream, isn't it? It's not. That's just ridiculous. Patricide runs in the family. Technically, there won't be any patricide in this entry, but it's close enough. Before the Olympian gods, Greek mythology was ruled by the Titans. Greatest of them was Uranus. Ah, uh, god of the universe. With his Uranus. God of the universe. That's right. With his wife Gaia, he had a son named Cronus. He, this is frequently confused with Kronos, the personification of time. But Cronus was the god of the harvest because of his close association with the scythe <laughs> of mythology. You see, Cronus was greedy, power hungry, and impatient. Uranus had also made the mistake of pissing off his wife while by banishing some of their more monstrous children, such as the Cyclops to Tartarus, the desolate wasteland of suffering deep in the Greek underworld. Steady on. It's like your son, he's got one eye. Banish him to the underworld! Gaia gathered up her remaining children to task them with overthrowing Uranus, but only Cronus was willing to challenge his own father. Armed with a scythe that had been given by his mother, Cronus set up an ambush. Uranus came to see Gaia, likely with the intent of siring some more children that he may or may not banish to hell, depending on how ugly they were. It was at that moment that Cronus struck, leaping out of the shadows with the scythe and chopping off Uranus's dick and his balls. F***ing hell. Surprise, motherfucker. With his father having been overthrown, Cronus and his sister Rhea took over as king and queen of the universe. The brother and sister would go on to have five children together, Demeter, Hestia, ha Hera, Hades, and Poseidon. However, Cronus was then informed by his parents that it was his destiny to be overthrown by his children, the same way that he had overthrown his father. Okay, I mean, not exactly the same way, as the prophecy didn't specifically mention castration, but it wasn't necessarily off the table either. Unprepared! To give up his throne, Cronus realized there was only one solution to this conundrum. He ate his children. Ah, of course. <laughs> the classic solution to the problem, eating the children. Right. 
Of course, he wasn't going to let a silly prophecy stop him from boning his sister on the reg, so she wound up pregnant again. This time, she went to the island of Crete. I recently went to vacation, on vacation to Crete. It was lovely. Uh, where she secretly gave birth to her son Zeus, then returned to Cronus with a large stone wrapped in swaddling clothing. Not only was Cronus an insane despot, he was also too f***ing stupid to tell the difference between a rock and his own child. He swallowed the rock and assumed that that was the end of it. Once Zeus was all grown up, Gaia gifted him with a magical bottle of Ipecac to feed to his father. Cronus drank the emetic and immediately vomited up his five other children. And also a rock. F what? What? They, they must be like he vomited them up they are very very well digested and chewed up <laughs> it's not the result she wanted they went to tartarus oh they were fine of course they were <laughs> it's mythology it's just people writing down their dreams while on acid they went to tartarus to free the monsters who then gave them their iconic weapons like poseidon's trident and zeus's thunderbolts a huge war ensued between the titans and the olympians and zeus was triumphant there are a couple of different endings to this story in some Zeus imprisons Cronus in Tartarus, while others, Cronus is made king of Elysium, the beautiful, serene fields of the afterlife. Wow. Two very different outcomes there. Are those are very different outcomes. They are indeed, Kevin. But even if he was being tortured in hell, at least Zeus let him keep his penis. The solution to all of life's problems. I touched on the Egyptian creation myth a little bit at the beginning, but it does eventually get a lot stranger. From the creation of the universe, the first god that took an active role in stuff was Ra. Ra created the earth, the other gods, humans, and beer. Legend. I'm sure he created a lot of other stuff too, but beer is actually relevant to this story. Ra thought that creating humanity was pretty cool and he wanted to go live among them. Well, he didn't want to live among them so much as he wanted to become Egypt's first pharaoh and rule over his adoring peasants like the god that he was. It's like, I want to go and live among the people so long as my life is substantially better than theirs and they worship me <laughs> as a god. But we're gods. We can do whatever we want. For a while, this worked great. Ra got to be pharaoh and everyone worshipped him. It was the life every god dreamed of. Unfortunately, after about a thousand years of this or so, people stopped treating Ra with the respect that he felt he deserved. Sure, he was clearly immortal, which was impressive, but so what? Ra had been sitting on the throne of Egypt for so long that he was perceived less as a god and more as just a piece of furniture. His mere presence was not enough to keep the behavior of the plebeians in line, and they began acting out. Well, Ra, just beat them. That's how you have to deal with peasants. Like, if the peasants get too uppity, just slap them. Slap them around a little bit. Take away their, I don't know, rain. Something like that. They'll care about that. There is no God in your face. This lack of discipline and respect from the common folk enraged Ra. He needed to teach humanity a lesson. You're probably familiar with the dumb philosophical question of can God create a rock so heavy that not even he can lift it? Well, Ra decided he was going to put this to the test. To punish humanity for their insolence, he created the goddess Sekhemet, who some is sometimes referred to as Sekhemet the Bloodthirsty. Sekhemet was an un Sekhemet? Sekhemet? Who gives a shit a met? Was an unstoppable killing machine, a goddess who lived to kill and whose bloodlust was never sated. She was so powerful and deadly that not even Ra or the other gods could stop her. His plan had worked exactly as intended, but if he wasn't being such a pouty little bitch face over the lack of obedience and worship, then he may have seen the fatal flaw in his plan. Yeah, it, wait, is she going to be able to kill him? I think so, right? He made her very powerful. Sekhmet was going to kill everyone. Oh, okay. Then he's going to be really bored. He's going to have no peasants to make himself feel better. This posed a major problem for Ra, but despite his initial douchebaggery, he was able to find a way to give this story a happy ending. Ra found out where Sekhmet was going to attack next, and he flooded the streets with beer that was dyed red with ochre and hematite. When Sekhmet arrived, she assumed everyone was already dead, and the streets were running oh, with their blood. Not wanting to let good blood go to waste, Sekhmet the bloodthirsty drank all the blood, resulting in her getting absolutely sh faced. After staggering around drunk for a full day without killing anybody, she finally sobered up and realized that she wasn't any less happy during the 24 hours when she wasn't exterminating all life on the planet, so there was no reason to keep killing everyone. In addition to being a warrior goddess, Sekhmet also became a goddess of healing. Somehow, to commemorate mankind's salvation, every year during the Feast of Hathor and Sekhmet, the Egyptians would honor the brutal goddess by getting blackout drunk on red-colored pomegranate beer. Sounds pretty good, to be honest. It's about sending a message. Since I didn't cover him at all last time, it's time to take a look at the Abrahamic god. Wait, is that regular ass god? 
I mean, to, to like my cultural background, like is that is that the big man in the sky that the Christians and the Jews, they, you know, uh, that is Abraham, right? That is the Abrahamic gods. I'm so dumb. I, I went to a school, like a Christian school where we learned about this shit. I went to church like twice a week. I'm like, Abrahamic gods? <laughs> Regular gods? <laughs> Especially in the Old Testament, God was a, yep. Bingo. There we go. God was a bit of an intolerant dick with highly disproportionate responses to perceived slights from humans. He also apparently had a fragile ego and wasn't afraid to cause unnecessary suffering to people just to prove a point. I also, I went to church twice a week, but we didn't really do much churchy stuff. There was like singing hymns. But mostly what we did is we focused on, we'd get the, the hymn books and we'd call it booking. <laughs> Have I told this story before? No, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, 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 wait. It was like, we'd be in the church and there'd be the hymn books and, you know, there'd be the pews and we'd sing like a hymn, right? And then at the end of every hymn, you'd get the hymn book and you'd close it and you'd put it. It's only funny to me because it's my history, but it isn't easy. And you know where it's going. You put the hymn book on the seat in front of you. So the person would sit down and go, oh, hello. And they'd have been booked. And so every, like the, the hundreds of people in this church, every single person before sitting down would be like, sit down. Because you didn't want to get booked. <laughs> uh, and sometimes, <laughs> remember sometimes the older kids would be like, you'd turn around, you'd see a book there. And then you'd look up and it'd be like a big kid. And they'd be like, <laughs> you have to sit on it. You're like, no. Uh, okay. Fascinating tangent, Simon. Let's carry on. Enter the wealthy landowner named Job. He's, it's written Job, but I know it's Job because of Arrested Development. Job had a wife, ten children, more livestock than one man could ever f*** himself. By. <laughs> and more livestock than one man could ever f*** himself. F***ing hell, Job. What are you up to? Oh, wait, that's the book of Leviticus, not Job. Okay, good for you, Job. Not f***ing your animals. Anyway, Job was devout and faithful. He always gave praise to God. He had a great life. God had a devoted servant, and they were both happy as clams with the relationship. One day, God was bragging to Satan about how awesome Job was, and Satan was like, nah, whatever, man. He only loves you because you gave him such a great life. If I take it away, there's no way he'd ever worship you. I don't know. I feel like my life's pretty tight. Like, generally, like, sh tends to work out pretty good. And I'm like, am I grateful to God? No, because he's not real. I'm just, like, grateful to the other the other stuff is about why um, I am where I am. Like, yeah, or, you know, f God. <laughs> what did he ever do for me? Dick all. You got not today, bitch. God chose to accept this new challenge and decided to allow Satan to murder Job's children and livestock. F Hell, that's not cool. Needless to say, if someone murdered all my livestock and children, I'd be very much like, wow, my life was really good. And uh, that, that, that is a bummer. That is a real bummer. I'll probably let's go around being like, life is pretty good. I'd be more like, F he killed all my livestock and children. A crushing blow? Yes. Will I get over it? Mm. No. I don't know if I'd really give a sh about the livestock so much anyway it'd be like si like i guess my youtube channels would be my livestock and if someone was like we destroyed all your livestock and also your children i'd be like okay i don't really care that much about the youtube channel <laughs> it really puts everything in perspective doesn't it it's like do i give a sh no not really i mean most of the time yeah but like when you put like things on the different thing like what's what you're like yeah f that <laughs> I literally couldn't give a shit. Needless to say, Job was a bit bummed, but at least he had his health, so he continued to worship God. Still not satisfied with Job's apparent piety, Satan was allowed to strike Job with his sores and blisters and to enfeeble him. Job cursed the day he was born. His wife told him that he should curse God's name and also give up and die. <laughs> Supportive. Real supportive. I get the first part, but the second half of that seems a bit harsh. Then again, this was ancient times, so Job's wife had probably been in, a, been in an arranged marriage with his first cousin, and there's a good chance they'd even like one another. The past was the worst. Despite her insistence, Job refused to curse God's name. Three of his friends came to comfort him and gave him pretty sh advice. If you're trying to cheer someone up, you probably shouldn't be all like, be glad this is all that happened because you probably deserve much worse. Job's got a shitty wife and sh 
friends, to be honest. Especially when you have no idea why you're being punished in the first place. Eventually, God appeared before Job and rewarded his continued devotion, even in the face of such unnecessary adversity, adversity by giving his health back. Hey, but, uh, yeah, okay, great, I've got my health back, but you murdered my f***ing kids, you douchebag. In the Quran, God gives him his children back along with new livestock and doubles his land and wealth. F*** yeah, Quran! That's the f***ing badger! In the Bible, it reads as if Job is just given 10 brand new children. F*** that, I don't want brand new children. I, want, I don't want to adopt 10 random children. I want my children. Quran's dope, man. That's, that's where it's at. Because kids are property that are apparently no better than cattle. I think the moral of this story is supposed to be something about loving God unconditionally, even in hard times. But all I took away from this is that if you want to murder people, just insult God and he'll give you permission to kill a bunch of children to prove how great he is. Fuck, oh, Bible's weird, man. Bible's some weird ass in there. Thanks for watching. such a serious job and I'm such a serious person.